I suppose it's the love of the job and the friends that you made, I thoroughly enjoyed it here. You know, we took our lives in our hands every, on a daily basis and we had a really strong camaraderie. I mean, our grandfathers were very clever people. The ROF 37, which is ROF Bridgewater, uh, was put together to make uh, RDX explosive for the bounce of bomb and something called the Grand Slam bomb as well. All ordnance factories were making prefabricated houses called airy houses and some were constructed here on site outside the fence just up the road here and they were the married policemen's quarters. So as soon as my father was married they moved into number 29 Wallabington Road. So I, the story is I was born in a house inside the factory and in 1978 I came back to work here for nearly 30 years. Uh, so, um, and I also wrote the book. It's become a big part of my life. I can remember playing around the 37 Club here and un unbeknownst to me these shuffling old men in their trench coats and their trilbies were war heroes and they were only in their 40s and 50s. Uh, some of them were still in their 30s. I can't really remember many VIPs. It was a very strange culture because people weren't that important to us. If they walked into an explosive building uh, we were dressed like tramps, really, because we couldn't have buttons. We were sort of tied around the middle like bailer twine. You could wear none of your own clothes. Technically, you're not even wear, supposed to wear your own underpants, but the scratchy things they gave us were awful, so we did. We didn't have... we, we could only write with a pencil without, without uh, paint on it. They couldn't use a pen because it would be ferric metal. So if someone walked in, it didn't really matter who they are, they did as we told them. They weren't our equals. You know, we took our lives in our hands every, on a daily basis and we had a really strong camaraderie. So the reason I don't remember them, they, they didn't register, really. When I started in the 56 as an apprentice, the Americans were pouring money in here. It was just after Korea and they were built, uh, the Cold War was building up more and more all the time. And the Americans poured a lot of money in here to refurbish and bring up bring the factory up to date and making the nitrating RDX and different explosives. They started making RDX as far as I know in 1941. I think the factory started in early 1939. All the explosive buildings were mounded. They had big earth mounds around them. They weren't underground. A lot of people was under the impression it was underground somewhere, but it wasn't. There's was big mounds around. And the roofs, the roofs were fragile roofs. So if there was an explosion, it went straight up and not out. I started at the factory on the 5th of December, 1966. And the first day was actually spent just getting dressed in the appropriate workwear for working in a laboratory with very strong acids, waters, coal, ash, gas testing, you name it, it was there. I went across to the stores and right, what size trousers are you? And they gave me the trousers. Oh, we got them in your waist, but they may be a bit long, but never mind. Go, go over and see the tailoress and she'll actually amend them for you. Now, what size shoes are you? Yeah, I'm size nine. Mm, these might be a bit tight, but if you go and see the cobbler, he will adjust them for you. And, and it was that sort of industry. Everything was there to be had. We had two boiler houses. We had two steam generators. And the idea being that if, if the uh, electric supply, the mains electric supply failed, then within seconds, they could actually then turn and, and produce our own electricity. And it's not common knowledge, but during the miners' strike, we actually supplied Bridgewater with electricity. We had a visit by Tom King, who was our MP, and one of the girls, I won't mention her name, they were having trout to this particular lunchtime, <laughs> and she was taking it out and she two on it, two in her hand, and she dropped one. So she picked it up, wiped it off, sorted it all, made it nice, and gave it to Tom King. <laughs> uh, and he still doesn't know to this day. <laughs> I know they used to sell cigarettes in the canteen for about uh, six but a shilling a time, six months a time, something like that, one cigarette. Because you obviously couldn't bring cigarettes into the factory. When we did Christmas dinner, 
um, the lads in some of the lads in the canteen used to say, right, you go into the boardroom and they'd set all the tables out for the girls in the canteen and they would serve us Christmas dinner um, and we'd stay there till about half past one, quarter to two. And when we came out, they cleaned all the canteen, they'd done all the washing up. And we used to come in here and we never ever paid for a drink. Um, we've left home here tiddly more than once on Christmas Eve. Um, it was a lovely place to work and I wish it was still open. People have worked here all their lives. Um, you know, and um, I mean, like my husband, he worked from 1970 to 2000. You worked here 30 years. The canteen changed and it got into private hands. Um, I was lucky to be kept on um, until 1992 when they decided that they were going to close the canteen altogether um, and just do vending machines. So I left in 1992. I thoroughly enjoyed it here. Some famous people worked here, and one of them was W.H. Simmons, and he introduced the RDX process to the ROF, and he became chemist in charge of laboratories. And he had this bright idea of making sheet explosive. And I remember one famous day, he walked into the lab and said, Here you are, Paul. Here's two pounds of RDX. Now, when I tell you that 20 grams of RDX that sat on a quarter-inch mild steel plate on sand, detonated with a number eight fuse, blows a hole straight through, through the force that it builds up to the atmosphere. He gave me two pounds. All of a sudden, everybody disappeared out of the laboratory. I did this, went back to him, and he gave me a rolling pin and some uh, chalk dust, and he told me to roll this out. And I rolled it out in a sheet about this size. I suppose about that thick, I suppose. It was over a tenth, at any rate, maybe three sixteenths or something like that. And he said to me, right, he said, cut it up into strips, put it in the leather bag that we used to, and put it on the back of your bicycle and cycle down to the detonation compound. I mean, you wouldn't, health and safety was slightly different in those days. And he said, what I want you to do, he said, is wrap some of this plastic explosive around this tube and put a number eight in, wire it up. He stayed in the detonation compound. And I came back, he pressed the button and there was an almighty explosion. We went down and couldn't find the tube. The tubes had gone totally out of the, the detonation compound. But when we did find them, it had been cut absolutely perfectly. And this was the start of the explosives that were used to cut the North Sea pipes, the oil pipes, when you want to cut, you could cut this underwater. And that was developed, initially developed by, well, I had a little hand in it with a rolling pin, but it was Bill Simmons' idea, and he was a brilliant chemist, an absolutely brilliant chemist. They wouldn't have liked it if we'd done that all the time. I felt I was so lucky I actually got an apprenticeship. It was fantastic. We had danger money, £5 a week, danger money, most I ever earned in my life. 